in Ballycroy, County Mayo, stands a dilapidated dance hall. It's not much to look at now, but it was here that the film The Ballroom of Romance was shot. Adapted from a short story by William Trevor, the film was a BBC RTE co-production. It appeared on our televisions during the Christmas holidays of 1982 and went on to win a BAFTA award and worldwide acclaim, launching the international career of its director, Pat O'Connor. Eugene O'Brien, writer of the play Eden and the TV series Pure Mule, has been madly in love with that 50-minute film for 30 years. Well, I would have to say that The Balm of Romance is probably the biggest single influence on my work as a writer. As a friend of Eugene's with deep connections of my own to the parish of Ballycroy, I've invited him to come out west to visit the old ballroom and to meet some of the locals involved in the making of the film. The old saying was, if you don't marry the one you love, love the one you marry. And then if you were lucky enough to get a girl in at the dance, you had to leave her home on the bar of the bike. <laughs> you know. <laughs> that woman needs a strong pair of hands to provide for her, basically, or, you know, to create, put the food on the table. It's a pretty bleak story. The main setting for the film is the actual ballroom itself. It's like another character in the film. This ballroom is in the middle of nowhere. Huge sky, small building, out in the wilds. Out, you two now, come on, out you go. Ooh, there's a bird just flew through the window. So it's much smaller than I thought it would be. There's kind of uh, holes in the floorboards and bits of stuff everywhere in glass. And um, But I still recognise it very much as the ballroom from the film. So it's amazing to be in the place. It's like uh, taking 30 years to get here, but it's amazing. Romance started when, well, I was about 15. I just turned 15, 1982, October, and it was shown in December. And there was a lot of hype about it. It was on the front of the RT Guide, and we all sat down to watch it. And the first time I watched it, I didn't quite get it. I thought it was a bit slow. There wasn't enough story for me. I thought, I liked it, but I wasn't. And then the BBC showed it, and then the second time I saw it, it absolutely clicked. And I, I just fell in love with it. There was something inside me that was really, really connected with it. And then I kind of taped it and I used to watch it all the time. And I got the lads in school to watch it. So then everyone kind of got into it. And, and then I, I, by that stage, I knew that's what I wanted to do. That the only, the only thing I was ever going to do was making things up. The Ballroom of Romance is the story of a pivotal night in the life of 36-year-old Bridie, played by Brenda Fricker who lives with her crippled father on a small farm in the 1950s and whose search for love is hampered by fate and cruel circumstances. The action of the film occurs almost entirely in the ballroom. It begins with this remote and windswept hall being opened by Mr and Mrs Dwyer, played by Cyril Cusack and Mae Aulis. We're then introduced to Bridie and her father and the hardship of life on their quiet hillside farm. A line I always loved was um, when she's sitting with her dad and they're having their bit of tea and she has a red dress on and it's a Friday, so... And he kind of says, I'm an awful old burden on you, Bridie. Get on with you, of course you're not. I'm as happy years anywhere. Thank you, my terrible boss, aren't you? Oh, 
was what God sent us. And it's kind of a conversation that they, I think they probably have every Friday. You're going down tonight. And I'm dressed for it. And then she, she kind of leaves him on his own and he puts his hat up on the mantelpiece and he kind of sits. It cuts between her on the bike going to the ballroom and him sitting on his own. And the only thing that you hear in the soundtrack is a dog barking and he kind of looks around when the dog barks and then back to staring at the fireplace. I had this old battered VHS copy that I would take around with me wherever I went and um, people would be shown it. Because it, it was never out in video, a lot of people had never seen it. But everyone had to watch it. Like, you, you know, you couldn't be my friend unless you watched it, kind of thing. I was living in a house with actor friends of mine, so I used to show it to them. And we used to learn the dialogue off, like saddles. And then we started working with the actors who were in it, and we could quote the dialogue at them. And they, they would have forgotten what their lines were, you know what I mean? So it became a cult. Friday arrives at the hall and is asked the same question she's asked every Friday by Mr. Dwyer. How's the dad? Is he keeping fit? Oh, he's grand, Mr. Dwyer. Oh, that's good. Let's go up and see him one of these days. He's like that, Mr. Dwyer. The hall is filling with the eligible men and women of the community, all dressed to the nines. Among them is an intriguingly mute and ruggedly handsome bachelor known as the man with the long arms, played by Ballycroy sheep farmer Pat Gallagher. Now I got the part was... Up at Clary's there, there was an old building there where the N59 is now, and that's where the interviews were being done. And when I went in, it was late in the evening, I was just on holidays at the time, and Mary, my wife, had come down, and I said, what's going on up there? Oh, and she said, there's people coming and going, and she said, it's, it's interesting, she said, you should go up to see. And I went up, and there was five or six in the room, and they asked me my age and everything like that then, and that was it. I was just going down towards the road again, and some man came down after me, and he called me back, and he said, would you be shy in front of a camera? I said, no, no, I wouldn't. But uh, they said, since we opened here this morning, we're looking for a certain type of a person. And as soon as he came in the door, we just said to each other, this could be it. And well, I said, if you think I'm suitable, I said, I don't mind at all, I'll have a go at it. They said, if, you, if you're not suitable, if you don't do it for us, he said, we have to bring you another actor from Dublin. Eenie Mackie, she's very kind of tight and all sort That's the way she wants to be, she can stay that way. <laughs> Pat Gallagher's big scene takes place in the gents. He He's in the foreground of the scene, combing his hair, grooming himself, very sober, very upright. While in the background we have the three amigos of Joe Pilkington and John Kavna and Neil Tobin <laughs> sneering and talking about young ones and drinking whiskey. Did you see the new young one that they have down in Conway's shop? She's just been let out by the nuns. Is she outside? Oh no, no, she's not here. Oh, but she has lovely hair. Now she'll be along one of these nights. <laughs> mm. Pilkington lights a match and goes up to Pat's uh, arse with it. <laughs> but Pat doesn't flinch throughout the whole scene. He just continues to comb his hair. <coughs> and Pat walks out and the guys continue and then Cyril comes in to clear them out. So, Come on now, out. You too. Come on now. It's, it's a scene that is very funny and, um, and we need that in the film. In there, in the gents, that's where the scene was done with me, with Neil Tobin and Joe Pilkington and John Kavanagh. And it was, oh, it was, I, I'd never forget it, I thought it was brilliant. It, it was very funny now, I, uh, I was, naturally I wasn't used to cameras. One take, I think it was Pat O'Connor, he couldn't get over it. He said, there's many a time, he said, people now with experience and everything, he said, it might take seven takes, you know. But I, I didn't know, you know, I just... So I was trying to pass the time, I thought it was a bit long, trying to, to keep calm me. <laughs> many, many a couple met here, and maybe many a couple parted here as well. <laughs> but many a couple definitely, you know, met here, because uh, the immigration was bad, but there were still a lot of young men and young girls around here at the time, and then they just come from other parishes. Some of them you cycled from the home uh, just across the bay here now, but they had to go to Banya naturally and come up. It was about, oh, about, it would be over more than 30 miles anyway to cycle here to the dances. 
I can remember this hall here being packed, packed, jammed to the door. And then the gents were over there on the far side and the ladies there. And up here at the top then there was a the kitchen and then outside the door down there, there'd be a line of bikes, maybe six deep each side, outside, you know. Everyone tried to get their own bike then and head home and maybe go the other direction if you're lucky enough to get a girl at the dance and leave her home on the bar of the bike. <laughs> But the man that built it in the first place, he, he was a great man just out of the blue to take an ocean to build it, you know, here and in, in where there wasn't much activity going on. He, he was a Corrigan man, a Jim Corrigan that built it. But, uh, you know, it has, it has story, if it could talk, it has some stories to tell. You know, there, there was many a jolly night here. Pat takes us to his home by the Owen Duff River to meet Bridgie Toher, who with her husband Willie used to run the hall back in its prime. I remember the morning that Pat O'Connor called to our house and they explained about what they were going to do about this film and over a cup of tea we had the crack. It's because we uh, ran the hall for years. We knew all about the running of it and we sort of um, co-directed it sort of thing <laughs> back to the days when we were running it. We darkened the walls, you know, because they were painted in bright colours. The walls, there were smoky walls, and it was brought back a bit, you know, to the 50s. So um, we did a lot of work on it. And, of course, we were well paid for it. It was very enjoyable, in fact, leading up to it, with, with uh, all the extras coming there, us all going there and getting fitted out for, for the suits and the ladies for the dresses and everything. It was, it was, it was a very enjoyable time. We enjoyed it from a height. And I had the younger lads had lovely heads of hair and long locks and all that, but they had to get them back like in the 50s style. And, and uh, some of them didn't like it, but <laughs> they, they, they had to, uh, if they wanted to be in the film, they had to, they had to do that. There was one man here and he had, uh, he had a long head of hair that was down his shoulders, like, and he had to get it off and the long locks off. When he at home, his own dog nearly ate him. He didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> That line was delivered by Marty Murray, who in the film plays the accordion player in the dance band. Marty reminisces with Pat and Bridgie. Well, it was even more like what the dances used to be like here. They did it, you know, more like how the dances were at the time. <laughs> Great bands going down last time. Great dance bands. play all what that time, quick steps and fox trots and tangos mm -hmm. and we did a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it gets a big crowd when you had the two Benny really because the hall was only licensed for three hundred. There was another snag there. There was often four there. <laughs> what could you do when people uh, are come? Uh, you couldn't uh, say that. Let them in. Yeah, yeah let them in. Yeah. Marty recalls the music being recorded for the film. There's Tony Chambers, he had a band of his own, but that wasn't his band that was there. Well, it was Tony Chambers' band that opened the hall. It's the first band that ever played in the hall in 47. It was Tony Chambers and his son. The son was on the drums. And then I was playing the accordion. I don't know how I got to be there. I think it was Willie Tarr that sent them to me. See, would I join the band to make up a trio? Well, he thought you being the local musician at the yeah. time, that, you know, it was a chance yeah. for you to be there. So I said, have a go at it anyway, don't The music was pre-recorded, you see. With the miming in the film, yeah. But we actually played, you know, beforehand. What I like about this about the drama as well and over the years and the, uh, the more you get into doing your own stuff the more you appreciate it is that it is really shot like a film it's paced like a, like a movie there's a lovely pace to it and, I, and there's a lovely detail uh, where, where sometimes the camera's just there's a, a, a high angle shot of the ballroom people just dancing and the, the mirror ball in the middle and it, and it holds on people just dancing for quite a long time I, I, at times and I, I just really like that it brought back memories, you know, to some of us. They always, <laughs> when we were in the hall, you know, going to the dances at that time. Yeah, seeing the men crossing the floor, you know. It would be a terrible thing then great. to refuse any 
boy to dress. If you had to turn back, it was a devil out the other Yes, yes. <laughs> There was a story about this fellow who crossed the hall and asked a girl to dance. And she refused. And he said, what's wrong? He said, why don't you dance with me? She said, I'm particular who I dance with. Well, he said, I'm not. That's why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> Pat is a member of the Ballycroy Community Council, and tonight they're holding a dance in their local centre to celebrate 30 years since the film was aired. We'll have it like, like it is there now, the, the ladies on one side and the, the men on the other, and uh, with Frank Chambers' band from Newport. You know, there was never anything really made of the film here in Ballycroy. We never cashed in on it anyway. So we just thought that this might be a good time to highlight it again and, and bring, bring it back to life again. Frank Chambers, I'm a son of Tony Chambers. When you knocked on the door today, 30 years ago, a guy knocked on the door just the same as you did, like deja vu. He says he was making a film called The Ballroom of Romance, and he says, Can I speak to Tony? He asked her to play a few tunes on saxophone, and the father played a few tunes for him, and he just says, You're just the man I want for the job. Now, that came about from Willie Totter here in uh, Ballacroy. And Willie says this Pat O'Connor, there's a guy still alive that's playing music, Tony Chambers. Go and see him. Well, we came down to Bellacry to play a few tunes for recording. And the, as the fans would just play normal, just don't pretend there's anyone in the hall at all, just play away and they'd record. But Pat O'Connor loved the sound of alto sax in the distance and all that type of thing and as you know in the sound even there there's nothing like the sound of brass in a hall Tony to the drum in the film my brother the father would just hit a tune the brother was immortal and they played for about the three hours and they picked the tunes that the father played in the 40s Red River Valley The Old Bog Road uh, Good Night Sweetheart all those tunes and they based the film around the tunes there was no second take I'm Des O'Rourke and at the time of the making of the film I was the sergeant in Bank Herreras, which covered Barry Cry. The then local guard, Tom Chambers, God rest him, he had the job, you could say, of recruiting all the extras for the film. His regular recruiting day would have been, at that time, people would be coming in, drawing unemployment into the local station, and Tom would uh, invite them to join the crew. And the people were very cooperative, and without much of exception, everybody agreed to participate in the film. We didn't become really involved until uh, the filming was about to start. Bearing in mind that at that particular time, tensions were running fairly high on a political scene both north and south in Ireland. The fact that the filming crews were comprised of both a Northern Ireland and a Southern Irish filming crew, it was felt that there might be a bit of animosity towards the British crew, which thankfully didn't manifest itself to any great extent. And any little bit of manifestation of that nature that developed or was about to develop with the assistance of, of the local contacts we nipped it in the bud, shall we say. But I never forget going into the catering tent the first morning. They always invited the 
the local police force in for breakfast. It was the first time ever I saw kippers being cooked for breakfast in any house. But obviously this was a dietary requirement of the British filming crew that they had kippers for breakfast. We get to the tea break in the dance, and at this stage now we, we've been introduced to all the, the main characters. Bowser Egan, played by John Kavna, is a man from the mountains. He lives with the Mammy, he likes to drink, and he has his eye on Bridie for many years. We've met uh, Eenie Mackie and, and her friends, the girls, the younger girls. We've met Madge, who's the kind of desperate spinster who's still coming to the ballroom and really should give it up but can't. And we know that Bridie was in love with a man who emigrated to England many years ago. And now she's kind of got the choice between the pretty hopeless Bowser Egan or harmless, reliable Dan O'Ryan, played by Mick Lally, who plays the drums in the band. You, you, you certainly feel that Bridie deserves better than Bowser Egan. Would we, would we take a lemonade and a packet of Kerry Greens, Bridie? Thanks. We're having the tea and sandwiches now, and it's coordinating with the break in the film for the tea and sandwiches at the dance on the night of the bottom of romance. Eddie Conway was also involved in organising tonight's dance. When the film was in made, um, I was in London. I didn't go to London that year. So we heard about the film being made through communication from home, which was by letter at the time. So you get out of your mother telling you there was a film being made in Barry Croix. It was quite exciting to hear about that kind of thing happening in a place where not every house at the time had a television. If you look at the context of the film itself, sure, the woman in the film, she's a 36-year-old woman. You go back into the 50s, uh, a 36-year-old unmarried woman, like, was, you'd hardly expect her to be getting married at that stage, you know. Women were married long before that, in their middle 20s and earlier. And if you hit your 30s, you were left on the shelf. So it just showed you that there wasn't that many eligible men left around the place to marry her, like, you know, and hope to have a family with. So, yeah, I think Paddy Cry was an ideal location for it because of the mass immigration that we had. The living at the time, you made it off the land. Your fuel came off the land. Your food came off the land. So that was all work that was done by hand. And that woman needed a strong pair of hands. Put the food on the table. It wasn't like going out to a job and getting paid a week's wages and buy your groceries. In rural Ireland at the time, you couldn't go out and buy a pint of milk like you can today. And there was very little groceries would be coming into a community like Ballyquire at the time. They were self-sufficient in almost and everything. The most thing they'd be buying would be paraffin oil for the lamps. They made their own bread. They grew their own potatoes, they grew their own vegetables, and more or less their, their own, they had the pig, hens, eggs, all that kind of stuff. That's where it all came from. So it was hard work. During the tea break, one of the best scenes in the film and most important scenes of the film takes place between Bridie and Dan O'Ryan. He's a road sweeper who has a problem with his eyes. Bridie approaches him and uh, they play out this very, very important scene, which I think is my favorite scene in the film and one of my favorite scenes ever. There's stuff called Optrix, stuff my father used, that time he had a cold in the eyes. The great thing about the scene is that they're killing themselves, pretending that this conversation is just ordinary and that they're actually discussing Optrix. I was only thinking of working on the roads, you know. It's the only work I know. Maybe it's not the right occupation for someone who has a weakness of the eyes. Maybe you'd be better off on a farm. There's less dust flying on a farm. It's a healthy life. I heard that on the wireless. I heard them saying it's the healthiest life you could choose. <laughs> I never worked on a farm. It has variety. You enjoy it so. And he kind of has a quick sup of the tea. Then they cut away to something else. Madge and all the band people were talking about the cement factory in Kilmanagh. And, oh, the Americans will be, be in at the top, Madge, or, or not at all. And then they come back to that scene. I have a little drop of it left. I could bring it over to you tomorrow night. Don't worry about it. Oh, it's not bother at all, honestly. Oh, Mrs. Griffin has uh, fixed me up with uh, 
a test with Dr. Creedy. And the old days don't worry me only when I'm reading the paper or out of the pictures. Mrs. Griffin says I'm straining them due to the lack of glasses. She's not really in love with Dano at all. He would do because he helps Carmel O'Connor in the church every Saturday and he doesn't drink and he's, he's reliable. But she finds out during the scene that Mrs. Griffin, the landlady I have, he kind of pauses awkwardly. Mrs. Griffin? Mrs. Griffin. The landlady I have. I'm in lodgings in her house. And she knows that Mrs. Griffin she has him so bright she's not even going to get Dano and she knows this was her last go you know for any kind of happiness was to be with poor old Dano who, who at least would look after her so there's only one way it's going to go now and she's faced then with the prospect of the bowel Bowser Egan Eileen Quinn also enjoyed that scene between Brenda Fricker and Mick Lally that is one of the things I love about the film when she says to him, my father is getting old and I need somebody for the farm. I think that is a brilliant piece <laughs> that I laugh about all the time. <laughs> and I thought she was a great actress. I mean, you could not laugh at how good it was. Eileen was there the night Corrigan's Hall opened in 1947. What I can remember about it was great excitement in the parish for us to have a dance hall. Before that, we had just house dances and we were getting a bit tired of that. We wanted something like famous bands, you know, coming into our parish and meeting different people from all parts of Mayo. And they did come from everywhere there. But we could not wait for the next dance to be on there and uh, you'd be getting ready all day for it. And I remember walking over to the hall and I was only about 16 and they, they were hooting at me because we were wearing all these long dresses, all the cars coming from everywhere. Oh, it was so exciting. You know, we'd have curlers in our hair all day, waiting, even though I had natural curly hair. I'd have curlers in from morning for the night. It was so exciting. <laughs> we were so young. <laughs> Back to work, boys. After the scene with Dan O'Ryan, a very disappointed bridie uh, retreats into the lady's toilet and talks with her friend, uh, the younger woman, Eenie Mackey. He'll marry Mrs. Griffin. Oh, go on, of course he won't. She's got him all right. Don't be talking through your head, bridie. She's a lumpish woman. She's nearly 50 years of age, yet she's took him off me. Sure isn't he to a penny, bridie? I'm Ingrid Craigie, and I play Eenie Mackey in the film. I was a very young actress at the time, and Ballroom was the first... It was, it was a film, really. I'd done some television. I'd worked with Pat O'Connor on The Riddens, and then he was making Ballroom, and I was cast in that. So that was, I mean, really exciting for me. I remember going to the set actually the first time and it was it was so shocking really because of this ballroom standing there in the middle of nowhere one of the many reasons why the film works so well i think it's so authentic that they didn't build a set we did it on location on the in the actual place the scenes in the toilets are the toilets the scenes in the back kitchen that's exactly that's what we had and that's what was used we had no dressing rooms or anything, so you had to dress in your bedroom in the hotel at six o'clock in the morning, freezing cold, get into my blue dress, which was beautiful, brine nylon, drip dry, that's one of my lines, with the underskirts. But we had to wear Wellingtons, I remember, and carry your shoes with you through the mud, in, and then only change when you got to the set. It's such a sad story. And I think Eni still has that optimism that young people have, that it's going to be fine. But she hasn't lived as long as Bridie. Did you never think about Sir Egan? He has an eye for you, do you know that? When his mother dies, he'll have a place to sell. He'd move in with you and your dad and bring a bit with him, Bridie. <laughs> yeah, he'd move in all right. Sit around all day reading about greyhounds and the independent. 
She never lifts a hand. Except to convey himself down to Carey's bar every night of his life. Probably by an old car for the journey. There's some settles down in a marriage. You know, when will Bridie get married? He's not going to marry her until the mummy dies and she could be too old to have children. She could be... That could be just it, you know. She'll end up with a man who doesn't love her and she doesn't love him and... Is that better than being alone? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. You're on a chance with any man, Bridie. You're on a certainty with Egan. Bowser Egan's big scene and it's a wonderful scene and it's it's brilliantly played by John Kavner. Uh, boyish Brendan Conroy has asked Bridie out to dance. Bowser comes over and pushes Brendan away. Go home to your mammy boy, he says. And starts to dance with Bridie and then makes his, his kind of big play for her. He senses that Bridie is, is not keen on him at all, that Bridie is, is giving him no bit of warmth and that he's going to have to up the ante and put a real bid in. So he says... The mammy, she shook. She'd hardly last more than two years, I'd say. Your mother? When she goes, I send the whole place up. I send the pigs and the whole one on top of the world. And she just walks away from him and just, she says... I'd rather be on my own for the rest of my life than to lie in the bed with you. No, this is what I You're the third best and you're not even that. I could have made a go of it with Dan O'Ryan. Dan O'Ryan? Yes. Bowser says, will I come back again next week? You know, we'll try it again. But Bridie says, well, she's danced her last dance in this balm of romance. And from now on, she'll, she'll stay in of a Friday with her father and cook their tea. And he'll read his westerns and she'll wash the eggs in the sink and have them ready for the man on Monday. And that's the way it'll be from now on. Bowser is really crushed. The band are packing up. Bridie comes out, gets on her bicycle. She cycles away. The Dwyers start to sweep up the hall, and then Bowser is approached by a very desperate Madge. But you're looking great yourself, Bowser. Here, will you, will you have a fight? Well, Madge is, is, she's the warning. I mean, Bridie can see Madge and knows that whatever happens to me in five or ten years' time, I cannot end up like Madge. Madge is the wrong side of 40. The boys all joke about her. They, then they say, well, you wouldn't leave her standing at the crossroads all the same. But then they say, I think Madge could give it up one of these days. The old squint's not improving itself. And they kind of make a joke of her. And she's desperately in love with, with Pat Gallagher, the man with the long arms. And it's a lovely moment where she comes up to him and offers him a cigarette. And uh, he takes the cigarette and lights his own, but doesn't light hers. And she has to look in her own little bag for her own matches. The ultimate awful moment for poor Madge is where we're standing now is that the door of the ballroom Bowser is like in very bad humour very dark humour and poor Pat Levy's character Madge is, is trying to chat him up at the end of the night and saying so you could do with a drink <laughs> could you do with a drink yourself listen when we go for the Careys you, you can drink all night in Careys I, I was over there one time to four o'clock in the morning we great gas four of us isn't that what we're given life for? Bowser just looks at her and with absolute disdain and says, Go, Go home to your mammy, will you? Kavanagh leaves the scene, Bowser Egan leaves the scene, and then poor Madge says to, to the Dwyers who own the ballroom, What she got that I haven't? Farmer land, maybe. A farmer land, maybe. Yeah, it's just kind of pretty sad, and Madge leaves. This evening's anniversary dance has come to an end as well. Jerry Cafferkey recalls his late mother's affection for both the hall and the film. My mother would have been a big fan of the ballroom romance as well because the music used to bring her to life, she used to say. Oh, yes. And she was a good dancer. And then when the dad came back then and they were in, played a little part in the ballroom romance doing the waltz then, and she, they were over the moon at the time. The, the outfits and the costumes and stuff like that, they were all excited for it. And the, the whole idea of the whole thing, you know. And we often watch it now from a family of ten and we have little reunions every so often, only there two years ago. We had, and even in February we have a mass to celebrate their anniversaries. 
and we, that was one of the things we have. We put on the bond of romance. That is stuff. sad. It was yes, yes. Because we all immigrated at one time. Nine out of the ten of us were in England at one time, and most of us have come back again. But that was the story that time, and uh, it portrayed the story of the 1950s and how things happened there. Bowser Regan catches up with Bridie on the bike and they they walk along and he is very, very earnest and he won't go back to the ballroom ever again. It has no meaning anymore without her. See, I, I can work like a, like a black Trojan, Bridie. I'll be out in the fields every minute there's light and I could maybe, I could maybe make a little flower garden for you and I, I could buy a little car for you to make the shopping a bit easier. And he sounds very, you know, you, you kind of, you kind of nearly, you nearly want to buy it. But uh, she has to make a decision and she kind of wheels the bike away and she looks back at us and then she turns back towards him and uh, away from the direction of her home. And our hearts sink because we know now she is going to marry him. And then Bowser utters the immortal line, Will we go into the field? Righty. And then she turns towards the field and they cut away to the Dwyer's and the hall and then it's dawn. We come back and Bridie's on the bike going home and Bowser comes out of the field, takes a swig of the whiskey and throws it away and there's a bit of a smirk on his face and you just know that it was all just to get her into the field. There were several like her, you know, left looking after their parents and girls and then men as well. Yeah. A lot of men, you know, they waited to look after the old people and sort of they got old and things moved on. They were left, never got married. So what do the good people of Ballycroy make of the ballroom of romance? It was basically the, the people of Ballycroy themselves that portrayed a great image of the times they were in it. And it was a good story to it and a sad story. I thought that, that it was making the people far more backward. It created an impression that they were a backward people. It's a sad story, yeah, but it's, life was quite sad at the time, even though they say they talk about the good old days, but, I mean, life was sad and was very harsh. Ah, there was, there was great times here, and... You know, I, I, any time ever I pass it, I, you, you have to think about it, like. You know, you, you nearly feel or think that you, you hear the music in it, you know. It's a very beautiful film and one that has stayed with me and will stay with me and there's so much to celebrate in it really uh, the you know the, the photography the direction and the in incredible cast of the best all Irish ensemble ever gathered together uh, with legends like Cyril Cusick and Neil Tobin Joe Pilkington and even in supporting roles the likes of Breed Brennan and Anita Reeves Brendan Conroy uh, of course Brenda Fricker then who would go on to win the Oscar for My Left Foot eight years later but this is her best performance uh, as as Bridie it's, it's been great to spend time in Ballycroy and join in the celebrations and, and go to the dance and meet the people and uh, just to, to walk inside Corrigan's Hall in the ballroom is a, it's a great thrill for me and uh, it's made me feel even more connected to the ballroom of romance. Night Bridie. Night Madge. Night Bridie. Night, Mr. Dwyer. Night, Bridie. <laughs>